All righty. Thank you so much, everyone. Zoomers in person. This is great. Nancy Howell with Western Cuyahoga Audubon, one of the board members, and also the speaker for this evening. But before I start, uh, we have a couple of announcements. First of all, I'm going to introduce Dr. Sean Williams, an instructor at the Tri-C Eastern Campus. And I think you can see that he is doing a, an ornithology course. So Sean, come on up and let us know how things are working. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, and thank you so much, Nancy and all, for allowing me to just uh, tell you a few minutes about this course that I have, um, or I'm attempting to start at Cuyahoga Community College. Um, so uh, I'm an ornithologist and I'm a lecturer also at Tri-C. I am uh, running an ornithology course this spring. It's the first one of its kind at Tri-C, as far as anybody knows. Um, and so uh, ornithology, of course, is the study of birds. Um, this course uh, will cover um, uh, birds from a scientific perspective. So in this course, you'll learn about the ecology, the behavior, the physiology, um, uh, the uh, migration, for example, all from a scientific perspective. Um, so there's a lecture portion of the course as well as a lab portion of the course. Um, and I'll talk about uh, a little bit about those um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, I have a few uh, example slides from the course um, that I show in my class. And so I'll just go through a few of these topics and you can think about whether this would be of interest to you and how it might apply to you as um, a, a bird enthusiast. So um, we learn about diets of birds and as well how um, the bills of birds uh, basically follow um, what their diet is, right? So uh, in biology, we learn form follows function. Um, and so the form of the bill of, say, a vireo um, follows the function, which is to capture insects. And in fact, all insectivores have a relatively similar shape of the bill which is characterized by long, slender, with a hooked tip. Um, and so all of these species here are insectivores. Um, and so in this course, we learn about all the different uh, shapes of the bills and how they correspond to different diets. And so um, even if you have, even if you have no idea what, for example, this, you know, you've never seen what that is before in your life. Um, you can look at the bill and think, well, that's, I recognize that bill. It's an insectivore bill. I know it's going to be eating insects. It's probably going to also be foraging around on vegetation, right? And so um, if you're going to a place where, you know, there are birds that are unfamiliar to you, you can pretty well piece together what they eat, and maybe where to find them just by looking at their bills. We learn about migration. Um, and one of the topics we learn about migration is uh, navigation mechanisms. Um, so birds use uh, the constellations from the stars to orient themselves. And um, we learn a little bit about some of the experiments that led to that uh, conclusion. And so, for example, um, we apply this to our field knowledge. If you want to advance a slide. Um, here's a Blackburnian warbler migrating at night, uh, which is when they migrate. Uh, and, and so this Blackburnian warbler is using, right, different constellations in the night sky to figure out where it is geographically, um, in which direction to go in. However, if you want to advance, what happens when it's cloudy, right? And they can't see these constellations. What happens then? Are they completely disoriented? Are there other uh, navigation mechanisms that they then need to rely on? Um, we learn, these are just a few topics. Again, uh, one of the sample uh, things that we learn is um, how birds deposit uh, pigments into their plumage. And they do this um, either by uh, self synthesizing these pigments, right? And they can just make these pigments based on, um, you know, basically the, the biological processes that are already present. Um, 
Alternatively, they might need to consume certain chemicals called carotenoids to then uh, manipulate and then deposit those into the feathers. And so that's uh, commonly how we get some of the bright colors um, like in uh, Orioles. Now, um, this uh, I've, I've hand selected a few photos here just to demonstrate that um, we have a range here of color in these species, a really bright species, some, you know, with a little bit of color on them, and then some species that really almost have none of these bright colors, right? Um, well, as it turns out, uh, we can um, predict sort of or, or correlate uh, color that the bird has with its diet. And so um, the most uh, frugivorous birds or the birds that eat the most fruit are the ones that are the most colorful, right? So think of like tanagers, orioles. Um, insectivores then are going to be moderately colorful, right? Like vireos, this is a dick sisal here, um, uh, warblers. And then the least colorful birds are things that don't eat very much fruit or hardly any insects in their diet. Um, so gulls and hawks, for example, are lack color because they also lack these carotenoids in their diet. So you can think about how those topics might, in, if they interest you and how they might uh, expand your knowledge as uh, an enthusiast of birds. Um, we also spend about half of the course time in the field. So we go out and um, learn uh, about field identification. Most weeks in the field, we're learning about field identification of Ohio's birds. Um, I, I uh, hold the class to a standard of having learned 150 species, both by sight and sound by the end of the course. Um, in the past, we've had opportunities to uh, learn how to band birds. Go to the next slide. And then, um, Another thing that we learn in the field is how to uh, perform biodiversity surveys. Um, and so we uh, can sample biodiversity in a standardized way using, for example, point counts or transect surveys. And um, we learn how to record these data on data sheets, um, learn how to develop uh, transects, right, that we're going to standardize and sample the same time and place at a, a set um, duration. And if you want to go back to the original slide. Anyway, so um, this course is happening uh, this upcoming spring semester. First day of class is January 17th. Um, if you have, and, and we meet Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. Um, if you have any interest in this course, again, my name is uh, Professor Williams or, or Sean Williams. My um, email address is just sean.williams at tri-c.edu. Um, my phone number there as well. Uh, this information um, I've made available to Nancy, but um, I'll stick around for the meeting if you want to talk to me about it afterwards. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Appreciate that a lot. Um, some of you may have signed up for our e-blast, our e-newsletter, which comes out weekly. And we have this information and more uh, as to how to register for the class. Uh, so, but, you know, if this sounds of interest, think about it. Sounds like a lot of fun. All righty. So I think we are ready to get to our, our regular programming. Got a couple empty chairs there. And we can move people around. Is this the right one? It yes. is. Okay. Here. Wonderful. So, yep, it's our member meeting and speaker series. Let's move to the next slide. And that's me, Nancy Howell, board member. Next. All right, so a couple quick things. I will welcome everybody as I have before. Hopefully the weather will stay pretty nice until we're ready to leave and then it can snow all it wants to. Um, again, sign up for our Western Cuyahoga Audubon e-newsletter, which comes out uh, 
approximately every Tuesday, sometimes Wednesdays, and it's updating information. Uh, sometimes we have something that's changing quickly. Uh, we've added something like, like the uh, Tri-C uh, ornithology class. So this is the kind of thing that will keep you up to date. And you can uh, um, click off or whatever they call it um, to, uh, uh, to get off the e-newsletter if you want to. Um, we always want people to become a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon and uh, also to volunteer with Western Cuyahoga. There's always things to do, whether it's setting up chairs for a meeting or helping with a Christmas bird count or writing for our newsletter, lots and lots of things. Next, please. All righty, so we try to start right at seven o'clock. All right, it started at 7.02 today, but, <laughs> but we do have time constraints because so, we are meeting here at the Fairview Park Library. And yes, uh, we do have to be out of here at a certain time. Again, volunteers needed. This is where you reach me, Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. So let me know if you're interested in doing something, anything, please. Thank you. Next. Again, our e-newsletter, how to sign up for that. It's in our, it's in our pay print, printed newsletter, which we have at the back table. So if you'd like to pick up a printed newsletter, find out how to sign up, or just go to our website, www.wcaudubon.org. Very, very easy. Next. All right, Michelle. All right, that's me. All right, so I'm going to be covering our upcoming bird walks and how you connect, can connect with us on social media. All right, so we have the second Saturday bird walk coming up this Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, we meet at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot uh, between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the, the Rocky River Nature Center trails. Um, Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. And that's the only bird walk we have um, in December, uh, but we also have the Christmas bird count that um, Nancy will be talking about in a little bit. Uh, so on social media, you can connect with us on Facebook, on X, which was formerly Twitter, um, Instagram, and YouTube. So um, be sure to, to connect with us in those ways, and you can hear about all our upcoming events, and I share um, things of interest on Facebook as well. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Drina, you head on up here. Hello, everybody. Um, next slide, please. We're in our fourth season of our book club. And coming up January 16th, that is next month already, Vesper Flights by Helen McDonald. It's a series of essays and reflections, I would say, too, covering so much, so many different topics uh, related to nature, birds, uh, so many topics. And then in April, we'll be reading Finding the Mother Tree. Next slide, please. So some Vesper Flight resources. Um, you can find Helen McDonald on YouTube. And also it's available in uh, Cuyahoga system and also the Cleveland Public Library system. Next slide, please. And we also have our book discussions uh, recorded. And there's the site for that. And um, we have a recording from our last discussion of Glitter in the Green was such an excellent book about hummingbirds. Next slide, please. And then I always like to bring up David Lindo, our, our friend for the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. And he has such a wonderful website. He has next week coming up on the 12th, 13th and 14th, he does have uh, interviews. And um, since he's in England, uh, I believe it'll be about two o'clock here. So if you check out that's the uh, site, you'll see that they're on a different time scale there. And then also he does, he had an interview with John Dunn for Glitter in the Green. It was an excellent interview. Next slide, please. And then um, there's also some sites here. If you're interested in looking at books, they have books galore, and perhaps you're interested in some holiday gifts. Next slide, please. 
I brought along a couple books tonight that I thought I'd show. Um, Marianne Romito introduced uh, the board to this book, Listen to the Birds. And it is designed, I would say, for elementary kids. But what's um, just wonderful about this book is it has actual bird sounds. So you um, sign into an app called Birdie Memory. And as you use that app with Birdie Memory books, and this is one in the series, and you put your camera over a picture of a bird, it will play the bird's song. And they're quite accurate. Um, the author, Donald Kruzma, is just an excellent, um, I guess, audiologist of birds. I'm not sure what that term would be. Um, so it's... Um, I'll, we can pass it around. You can take a look at it. And then Audubon updated its um, kind of an introduction to nature book. And it's um, just last year, 2022 is the latest edition. And it uh, covers a wide variety of categories and uh, kind of an introduction to a lot of smaller topics, but also with an ecological uh, kind of framework, kind of looking at like conifer forests or looking at cliffs. Lots of birds are in it too. So um, just thought I'd show that, pass it around. And uh, in case that might also be something on your Christmas list for yourself too. Thank you very much. All righty. Thank you so much, Drina. Drina, I will say, does a fabulous job with these book discussions. I've attended other book discussions from other groups and they pale in comparison to what Drina puts together. Information, backgrounds, we, we talk, it's it's great. So if you can uh, read Vesper Flights by Helen McDonald uh, in, uh, and join us for our the January book discussion, that would be awesome. Marianne Romito, with our, our, who is our Climate Watch Coordinator. Hi, everybody. Um, after, well, after you get all done with the Christmas bird count this month, next month we have the Climate Watch um, survey, which um, I'm the, the Northeast Ohio coordinator. And anybody who wants to volunteer to do this, just let me know. My information will be here shortly. Next. Okay. The Audubon Climate Watch is a program that was developed by the National Audubon Society. And they're trying to... Well, if it, several years ago, they, they published this big website about survival by degrees. Has that anybody ever heard of that? Nobody? Oh, my goodness. Well, you got to go see this survival by degrees. Um, it's a fascinating website, and it's, they're predicting what's going to happen to the birds when the climate changes. If it goes up, to, you know, if it goes up a degree uh, Celsius or three degrees or five degrees, and the amount of territory that each species is going to lose. So I highly recommend you look at that. Next one. The climate watch is, climate change is one of the biggest threats to birds around the world. C community scientists can now help us find out, find how birds are responding to climate change as it is happening. And this kind of research takes years to to develop and we're so anybody who wants to participate in this would be glad it'd be, it'd be helpful if we could have more data every single year. Uh, we've had a couple of years already that we've got some data under our belts, but it's going to be ongoing. Next. So the the climate watch for the winter is from January 15th through February 15th. Now the not the second Saturday, which is the second Saturday walk, and not the fourth Saturday, which is the Tremont walk, but the third Saturday is the Saturday we're going to be doing our big climate watch survey. So if anybody who wants to join in can, can do it that way. But if you can't make it that day, you can do it any day in between the January to 15 to February 15 time period. Just let me know. Next. And this is how you get in touch with me. Um, there's my email there and my phone number and yeah, take a picture of it so that you can call me. <laughs> um, the, the, the top line there is a video of the presentation that I did last year on how to do the climate watch survey, but you can always just call me and I will gladly walk you through it. It's not that difficult. Um, so does anybody have any questions about this? I don't know yet. 
I'm sorry, but the, there, there is an app that you can download onto your phone um, where you can do your surveys. And Michelle used it last time and she said she did it successfully. I didn't even bother trying it. But, you know, everybody who, you know, you want to try it, I would say go ahead and do it. But if, if not, you can use eBird or you can use paper and then come back home and put it, download it onto the, the website, which I can explain all to you if you give me a call. So if you got any questions, I'll be here after the meeting too. I think that's it, right? Yep. yep. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, maybe you noticed on the slide the date for the one and done. If if everybody goes out and does that, Climate Watch is January twentieth, which is a a, a Saturday. Um, but as Marianne mentioned, anywhere time between January fifteenth and February fifteenth. If that twentieth doesn't work for you, you can go out any of those days and do your sightings. By the way, uh, at the back table in one of the little holders, there is a brief bit of information, uh, survival by degrees. It just gives a touch as to what um, what survival by degrees is like and also um, what what changes will be happening if and or when the uh, climate does warm. Oh, Marianne also uh, has a couple things in her hand um, and I'm they're at the back table as well. Um, there are a couple of books. They are the Birds of the Cleveland Region, the small green guide, which has uh, information on bar graphs as to what birds uh, are in the area throughout Northeast Ohio, lots of different areas. And then uh, the larger version has more information on the uh, individual birds. So those are available free or for a donation. Again, there is a, uh, a bucket in the back and you can drop a, a penny, a nickel, a dime, a hundred dollars, whatever you think it's worth. So um, we've got you know lots of, lots of good stuff back there. So please don't leap, don't rush out of here. Take a look. All right, uh, I know Amanda uh, had some things going on. Her sister's birthday is today, so I will chat about the bird-friendly coffee. Next, please. Um, we are one of the few places that uh, does sell, or uh, you can order birds and beans, uh, which is this 100% Smithsonian bird-friendly coffee, organic, fair trade. I mean, everything you could possibly imagine it to be, it is. And it's good coffee too. We, there's a variety of, of grinds that you can order. There are, there's decaf, there's espresso, um, and you can order it from our homepage. There is a, a card at the back table. Again, check out that back table um, with the information about the Bird Friendly Coffee Club. January 10th will be when that uh, the order will be going in. So get your order in now, I mean, you don't have to wait until that time because that is the date the, the order will be going in. Um, the the uh, If we get enough uh, ounces, then shipping is free for us. We don't want to pass any shipping along to folks. So order, order, order. Remember, makes good gifts. Um, and then once the coffee comes in, with, which is within the week of the order, it is delivered directly to your home. You don't have to come anywhere to pick it up. We drop it off at your home. So it's a it's a deal. So think about that for um, a gift for yourself, New Year's, something like that. I don't know. Next, please. We place the orders quarterly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, October, I think, was the last one. And then now January. Okay. All right, and I did want to mention that uh, next month's speaker, again, in-house as well as Zoomed, uh, we have a double header, Tim Squared. Well, Tim Krynak and Tim Jasinski, they're going to be talking about using the MODIS technology to track rehabilitated birds. Uh, Tim Krynak is the Cleveland Metro Parks Natural Resources Manager. He understands the technology of the MODIS towers. Maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't. He's going to go through all that information. Tim Jasinski does the wildlife rehabbing uh, at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. So a lot of the birds that, that may strike the buildings that are rehabbed, particularly American woodcock, but they may be putting transmitters on other species, 
that's what they've been uh, trying to follow. So I hope you'll be able to join us Tuesday, January 2nd, January 1st. Remember, stop drinking <laughs> and join us on Tuesday the 2nd. Uh, and again, we start right at seven o'clock. So, so be here. It's going to be great. Next, please. Oh, it's me. And yes, Christmas bird count 2023. It's almost here. So let's uh, go into our, our uh, slideshow of the, oh, and yes, I always want to thank people. Please do check our, our website. And it's going to take, yep, it's going to take a moment to get to our slide uh, deck for the pro presentation. I'm surprised that didn't close when I did. It's coming. Don't freeze. Oh, I hate when that freezes. There we go. That's it, right? Yeah. Yep. That's it. Wonderful. All righty. So, yes, I am the compiler for the Lakewood Circle Christmas Bird Count. Each circle whether you're in Ohio, California, Mexico, whatever has a name. It doesn't mean it's taking place only in Lakewood. We uh, take a look at this map and you can see where our circle goes and we'll, I'll talk about it more. So go ahead, next slide, please. So the date for the Christmas bird count is Saturday, December 30th. Um, it, you go out all day, part of the day, start at 12.01 in the morning if you'd like or end at 11.59 in the evening if you'd like, but this is the day that our circle goes out for uh, for our Christmas bird count, Saturday, December 30th. Put it on your in your phone right now, right now, right now, okay? Um, we generally have a wrap up uh, after all the data comes in. Uh, I, I put it together and list the species and, and what was cited and some exciting things. And that is to be determined. Uh, it's going to be sometime in January, uh, and it's going to be via Zoom. Next, please. So I thought maybe you'd like to see some of the some of the folks that have been out. Next. All right. So here is our count circle. Um, basically, it's fifteen miles diameter, seven and a half miles radius. And it, it goes way out into the lake. So who's going out into Lake Erie? <laughs> I don't see anybody's hands going up. But you know what? If the lake stays unfrozen now, uh, we may, in the future, decide to get a boat and go out and see what's out there. <laughs> um, but the reason that the circle was created in this manner is we wanted to get as much of the Lake Erie shoreline as possible. So you can see the, um, the circle goes into Lorraine County. Again, it doesn't have to be just in Cuyahoga County. It goes into Lorraine County hitting Avon Lake, Avon, North Ridgeville, just a tad. Basically, basically to the south, uh, I say maybe like um, I-80, uh, the, the turnpike, and then comes up to the east through Brooklyn, uh, Lakewood, and doesn't hit the Cuyahoga River, okay? People ask that a lot. How come it's not hitting the Cuyahoga River? Our circle just doesn't hit the Cuyahoga River. Okay, next. Um, the pins are dropped into areas that are generally covered. Um, oh, by the way, look at the Cuyahoga Community College Western Campus is covered. So, and we get we get Mer we get Merlin there. So, I, I bet you do at Eastern maybe. I don't know. Uh, Sorry, we just have to rub it in with the with the Cuyahoga Community College folks. So there are a lot of places that you can see that pins are not dropped. Oh my! Oh, a Bay Village. Uh, I think the year that we created this Bay Village, um, we didn't have anybody doing that, but we'll hopefully get somebody. Again, it's suburban, it's urban, but guess what? Birds are there. So walk your neighborhood. Um, join a group that's in the park areas. We're going to go cover a lot of that. I just wanted to kind of show you um, just the, the breadth of our points. 
Next, please. All right, so National Audubon is the uh, is the authority that selects the that uh, says, hey, you can go out for Christmas bird counts anytime between December 14th through January 5th. That's uh, the compilers can select a date anywhere in those areas. So there are several count circles in Northeast Ohio. Again, ours is going Saturday, December 30th. Because again, I do get questions asked. People say, well, it's anywhere between December 14th and January 5th. Can I go? Out? No, that's our day. That No, you cannot go out on other days. <laughs> All right. Can you join other Christmas bird counts? Absolutely. And I think our next slide has information on some of the other circles. There we are. So uh, the east side or the Cleveland circle is coming up on Saturday, December 16th. The compiler is Laura Gooch. The Illyria CBC is on December 17th, a Sunday. Oh, but so is the Cuyahoga Falls Christmas bird count in Summit County. Um, they're, they're both taking place on the same day, but generally CBCers, people who participate aren't gonna be maybe going that far. So, you know, maybe you say, hmm, maybe I'd like to do Lorain County one year or Cuyahoga Falls the next year. Uh, Wellington is on December 23rd. Uh, that's also Lorain County. Here's ours, da da da. Lakewood and on um, December thirtieth, and also uh, the Mentor count on the thirtieth. And I, there's a few more. There's one in Geauga County and uh, and further south. So you can look at the Audubon website, type in Christmas bird count. Up will come information, and you can find uh, circles that, all over the place. Next, please. Just again, wanted to show you the east side circle, the Cleveland circle, the west side, Lakewood circle, neither of them hits the Cuyahoga River. There's a, there's a space in between. So don't bother me about the Cuyahoga River. <laughs> All right, next. Aw. Oh. Okay, identify. Oh, good, what, identify. Yeah, it's a Sean Missig. All right, next please. All right, so please contact me if uh, you know of somebody who would like to participate. Um, we have, I, I'll answer all your questions, just like Marianne said with her uh, Climate Watch, I am the one to, I am the go-to for Christmas bird count in our Lakewood circle. Next. All right, just to cover a few areas and you might be familiar with some, you might not be familiar with some. The ones in, in yellow are, as you can see, covered. Um, there are a few that are, well, the lakefront, Cleveland Lakefront Eastern and Cleveland Lakefront Western sections, those are usually covered by people that have access to some private property. So um, joining those groups is, is pretty difficult, uh, but there's, there's a few there. If anybody has a question as to where those are. Okay, next slide. These are some of the these are some of the uh, points that were dropped in. Uh, you can see the airport, Rocky River Valley, oh, uh, Byers Pond, Lake Isaac. That needs to be the Lake to Lake Trail. Um, again, all along Big Creek Parkway, Puritus Wetlands, Renaissance Senior Living Center. Next, please. The, there is a driving route uh, that the southwest area, basically parts of Berea, Olmstead Township, Olmstead Falls, and a touch into North Ridgeville, basically with the with the turnpike being that southern route. Yes. Which one? Oh, yes. Right. Exactly. All right. So we can put that on. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Uh, Sunset Memorial Park. Try see campus that's covered uh some cemeteries um next but again think about what's in your neighborhood if you don't want to join a group if you just want to walk a, an hour that's okay so any senior living communities you could be a feeder watcher as long as it's in this count circle walk your neighborhoods pocket parks green spaces cemeteries 
Uh, there are driving routes too. Oh, you can get up early or stay stay up a little bit later and do some owling if you'd like. Um, but any of these areas do need to be covered. Okay, next. Um, yes, there we always have to be careful of things like COVID, flu, RSV. Uh, so you do want to probably either have a mask available if you are going to be with a group um, and use hand sanitizer. We highly recommend that you carpool only with family members um, rather than with other folks that you may not know uh, as well. Um, and should something happen with COVID cases, we will let you know if things are canceled or not. So far, past few years, even with the height of COVID, we did not cancel. So, but you know, people get sick. People call me up, email me. I can't go out that day. I'm sick. I'm like, cool. That's fine. No problem. Next. Oh, I thought I'd just toss in a few. All right. Next. All right, so again, our date, again, you're not gonna forget this, Saturday, December 30th, but there's also something called count week. Three days prior to the count day, three days after the count day are called, <clears throat> I'm sorry, are part of count week. So uh, you can see Sunday, December 31st, Monday and Tuesday, January 1st and 2nd are the three days after, the third, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Thursday, uh, uh, December 27th through 29th are the three days prior to. And I gave an example here. All right, so if turkey vultures were sighted a couple days before or a couple days after the count date, um, but no turkey vultures were seen on the count day, then they would be uh, added to our count week sightings. So it is important to keep your eyeballs open and it's probably not a bad idea if you're going out and checking out a site to you know, do some birding. Maybe you're gonna see something that uh, isn't there on count day. So get out and, and kind of preview things. Next. So just a graphic to show you, yep, our count day, boop, December 30th, the count week, three days prior, three days after. Okay. Make sense. Okay. Look at all those heads nodding. Right. Right. Zoomers. Yeah. All right. Next. Um, some people uh, use, or a lot of people use eBird, which is the way I like to have things sent to me, but I will be sending a checklist for 2023 out to everybody. If you want to do things on paper, maybe just your group, um, please notice the area covered by you or your team, please list that in there up at the top, whether it's, you know, uh, Rocky River Nature Center trails uh, or Cleveland Lakefront West section, Western section, and then start dropping in the birds as you, after you uh, maybe get everything uh, added up at the end of the day. But I'm gonna be sending a checklist electronically to everyone. Next. Keep going, there you go. So we get record all species of birds, feral pigeons, rock doves, house sparrows, star, starlings, sorry. A lot of people are keeping chickens now. So so really please don't count chickens or roosters. You know, you may, I don't know about ducks as much, uh, but please don't count the chickens. Um, so you can see how we listed that. And do consider owling early in the morning or, or in the uh, evening. Next, here's how your list hopefully will start looking at the end of the day. So, you know, just fill it in. Next, here's uh, our, our zoo folks and they are looking at information that the zoo has on peregrine falcons. I, I'll tell you, the zoo folks get some really interesting species. You know, king penguin, um, uh, Andean flamingo, uh, sorry. Uh, they, they really don't count those, but the zoo is a really, really attractive place. And yes, there are peregrines there and the zoo uh, actually has a nice display uh, talking about the peregrines that people can take a look at. Next, please. And just keep going, it'll, there you go. All right, part of the data collection is weather conditions um, during the day. 
uh, weather conditions when you start, weather conditions when you end. So if you're out at eight o'clock and finish at noon, you know, the weather <laughs> here in Northeast Ohio, it could be winter to summer in four hours. You just don't know. Precipitation, what is it doing? Um, if there's snowfall on the ground, kind of get an average depth. Maybe it's either snowing that day, I think it does, uh, or, or the snow maybe has fallen a few days ahead of time. Uh, oh, by the way, we go out rain, shine, snow, blizzard, ice, if you can. Okay, I want people to be safe though. Uh, list the names of all the participants in your group. If you have a group, if you're doing it alone, that's fine. Uh, but I like the names and emails because that's what National Audubon does like to have uh, when I send that into them. And please keep to your assigned routes. Uh, I know some people say, oh, I wonder if I should look at this lake over here or if I should cover this, this route over here. That, that means we're duplicating information. So, and I've had to... Uh, don't worry, I get I get all kinds of data in and I do sort things out. So, but please do uh, try to stay to your route. Next, please. So on the on the checklist, or again, if you're doing e-birding, um, you can jot down weather conditions. So just like you see there. If you go out in the afternoon, weather conditions will be changing probably, and you wanna keep track of those changes as well. All right, next. And keep track of the number of people. Again, on the checklist, there are uh, spaces that you can put people's names and email addresses. For those who might be doing eBirding, you can put that in the description, or when you send me your eBird list, uh, you can just say, oh, so-and-so went out with me, here's their, um, here's their email, or I look to see who you shared it with, and hopefully all those people went out with you as, as a group, so. Okay, easy, easy peasy, good. Next. Oh boy, more data, more data. Yes, keep track of hours and miles walked one way, since eBird does measure distances as one way. Keep track of the number of hours and miles driven uh, only during the count one way. If you take a break, let's say you're having lunch, don't count that as part of your hours. You know, eight eight o'clock to noon, maybe you're having lunch from noon to, to 12.45. Yeah, don't keep that a uh, running uh, tally. And then in the afternoon, maybe you go out again. So keep those separate. Uh, as far as your, your distance traveled and uh, miles walked, number of hours out. If you are feeder watching, keep track of the length of time at your feeder. Now, that doesn't mean you have to sit there and watch your feeder for three or four hours. You know, 15 minutes, you watch your feeder. Oh, jot down, jot down what you see. Um, then you do some ironing or wash the floor or whatever. And then you sit and have a cup of coffee and you watch the feeder another half an hour. Okay. So throughout the day, if you think about Wow, this added up to two and a half hours that I watched my feeder. And be careful on the number of birds that you're putting down. Uh, if you are watching your feeder and you see three cardinals, that's the max cardinals you had, three cardinals. But if you have three cardinals in the morning and then three cardinals 15 minutes later and then two cardinals, that's not three, six, seven, eight cardinals the maximum number of species you see at one time. So house sparrows are, are really notorious for like, boom, you get a bunch of them and then, oh, then a few. So again, try to the maximum number at your feeder at one time. Okay, is that clear? Clear as mud? Good. Next. Okay, again, on the, on the checklist, there is room for this kind of data. eBird. I can figure out uh, how many hours you were out. A lot of times the information is there. Um, but if you can jot some information down, how many hours you spent in the car, miles in the car, that type of thing. So next, it'll come out looking something like that. So you were out four hours, you traveled three miles, you were out half an hour in the car, you were zooming around five miles in the car in a half an hour, and you've spent 
time watching the feeder, boom, total of six hours, and the total miles was eight. E Z. But again, all this data I have to turn into National Audubon, and I have to sort through it all, and it's kind of challenging at times, but I do it. Okay, next. People having fun, not on a non-snowy day. Next, please. All right, so um, if you want to go to the eBird website, there is an article on eBird uh, about the Christmas bird counts. Please take a look at it. That might be useful for you because there are ways that you can do a trip report. So if you're stopping at different points on your route, uh, you can do a, a trip report. I haven't done that very successfully. A couple people send that in to me much more successfully. But the problem is the narrative section is usually not filled out, like the the um, the weather conditions. And that's the kind of stuff that needs to get filled in on those trip reports. All right, next. Um, again, using eBird, most of them are hotspots. Just find it. You stop at three areas, keep a separate list for each stop. Again, you can do a trip report there. You can all share your information through uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon, all one word. I don't know if it has to be capped, W, C, and A. I'm not sure. Uh, or you can scan the list, your paper list, or you can take a clear photo of the list and send it to me. Um, again, please remember names and emailed addresses of participants, weather conditions, hours on foot, miles on foot, hours in car, miles in car hours at feeder. I'm going to get it into everybody's head. Okay, next. Okay, a rare or unusual bird. Hmm. And yes, we have had people find some rarities. What do I do? Okay. Um, yes, uh, so, so we really do like a, a, a record of that information. A detailed description is fine. Uh, some behaviors is great. Photos are the best thing. Again, we got cameras on our phones, so hopefully uh, you may be able to get a, a photo. Next, or, or just keep, okay. Um, and just to let you know that if I question somebody about a rare or unusual species and send the, the infra documentation forms to somebody, it is not questioning anybody's uh, sighting. It is to document because this is the way National Audubon says, oh, wow, we've got such and such uh, in this area now, and we've never had those before. And I think one of our next photos will be, yeah, this is this one is, is a lot of fun. By the way, this is a, was across the street from the Tri-C Western Campus. <laughs> um, this was on a chimney. And this was in 2020. Not only were there turkey vultures, a number of them, but there were some black vultures. We've never had black. That was the first year we've ever, 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 ever had black vultures. And there's a nice description, nice uh, photograph. And so, boom, it's now on the list. And guess what? We're now starting to see black vultures more and more and more commonly in Northeast Ohio. Next. All right, so how about a bird you can't identify? Well, again, jot information down, get a photo if you can. Um, we can help with identification. Uh, I like I like identifying stuff, uh, even blurry photos. It's like, ah, what is this? But it, it's kind of fun. I, I know it's crazy to put this in, what should I wear? It's amazing what people come in. Um, yeah, think about the weather. Footwear, make sure it's nice and, uh, and warm. Hand warmers, you know, those little things that heat up are great. Uh, binoculars, of course. And a, uh, if you have a, a big area that you're going to be covering, fields, the lakefront, whatever, uh, a, a spotting scope is great. Next. So again, there's a lot of information from National Audubon. Um, and you could either just Google National Audubon Society or Christmas bird count and 
a lot of stuff will come up. Plus, uh, our, our, um, our, our Western Cuyahoga, we have uh, data for all of our Christmas counts, uh, maybe not all, but, um, and they're, unfortunately, they're listed in, in not the order that I would like to see. I'd like to see last year's and then the year before is underneath and the year before. No, it's kind of like, oh, there's 2009 and then 2014. And so you have to kind of sort through them. I don't know why, but that's our, our website just doesn't want to behave. Next. Oh, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I don't think this was on one of our counts. Next. Okay. Um, I don't know. Have we gotten any questions either in the chat? No, we haven't. Not okay or anything. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? What day is the count? Oh, yay. Very good. All right. All right. So uh, I have some photos of birds that might be a little bit challenging for identification. Um, some of you will maybe recognize a lot of these photos from my presentation last year. Uh, it's okay if you leave. I don't want you to leave though. But yeah, let's let's just go through them. I'll do some pointers. All right. Yep. One in the middle. One in the middle. Yeah. Small one. Look at that. Yeah, we got, and then we got some medium sized ones too. So Canada geese can come in large, medium, small, and extra small and extra large. Uh, but Canada geese um, that, that have been split from the, the large version, which are the Canada geese, and the smaller one is called a cackling goose. Uh, you notice the shorter neck, a stubby bill. I mean, look at the bill on it compared with the Canada's. Um, the body, not much larger, maybe a little plumper, but not much larger than, than a mallard. So they are small. And so when you see a flock of Canada geese, ooh, something different. Yeah. Uh, really do look through them, uh, because something will stick out like a sore thumb, or you may get some other kind of goose mixed in, um, white fronted goose, um, oh, snow goose will stick out like a real sore thumb because they're white, uh, unless it's the blue, uh, phase or blue version. All right. Yeah. So pay close attention to those Canada geese. They're they're not just, oh, no, another Canada goose. <laughs> All right. Next. All right. Here's a here's some that are kind of confusing. <clears throat> so you have a, a female mallard on the. Right. Um, and you can see she's kind of a, a nice milk chocolate brown speckled uh, that bright color on her wing is called a speculum. It's iridescent. You don't always see it. It can get tucked underneath. Um, and then you see the, the blue. And then on either side, there's a black stripe and a white stripe. Can everybody see that on the female mallard? Okay. Then we have the American black duck. And mallards and black ducks will often be together. Um, dark chocolate, milk chocolate mallard, dark chocolate black duck, okay? Um, so notice the head is light in color, but the rest of the body is deep, deep, deep uh, chocolate brown. And this one is also showing its speculum, again, that, that colorful patch on the wing. On a black duck, it's more of a purplish color. And all you see is the black stripe on either side of that, uh, purplish color, you do not see the white like the mallard has. All right, so get, take a look, good look at that. Oh, by the way, both male and female American black duck look very much alike. The female will have a much more greenish or mottled bill, whereas the male has a, a yellow bill. Mallards, I think you can tell a male and female mallard, yes? Male, male green head, okay, good. All right, next. Ooh. Whoa, what's this? Well, those mallards and black ducks sometimes like each other a lot. <laughs> and so you get a, a, a mallard uh, American black duck cross. Um, that is a bird that can be checked off on your uh, eBird checklist. So they don't always have to look exactly like this. They can be darker. But you can see the the this one is a male. You can see that 
kind of a chestnut breast where the male mallard has the chestnut. You see just a hint of green in the head. Um, the, the, but the head isn't all totally green. It's that lighter grayish brown that a male or that a, a black duck would have. The, and if you compared his body color with the body color of a female mallard, you would see that those feathers on the body, even though they, they look milk chocolatey, they are darker than, than the uh, uh, female mallard. So yeah, you may run into a, a, a American black duck mallard cross. Next. Oh boy, we don't have to worry too much inland about gulls. Um, Oh, I have to do my famous gall joke. <laughs> All right. So you see a gull by the sea, it's a seagull. You see a gull by the lake, it's a lake gull. Sure. You see a gull in a parking lot, it's a parking lot gull. You see a gull in a bay, it's a... Uh, sorry, I will leave now. <laughs> and they may be eating bagels. It just depends on where you are. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of the gulls, a lot of the gulls that are inland are the ring-billed gulls. You'll see them in parking lots. You'll see them in grassy areas. Um, so what to look for? Well, yeah, I'm going to leave, leave the, the uh, gull searching for the folks who are doing the, the lakefront. They know what to look for. But herring gull, larger gull in the winter. You can see it has the dark modeling in the back of the neck, but it has pink legs, pink feet. Um, you may not see the red spot on the lower mandible. And then the first winter, the bird that was a bird that was hatched this year was this dark, dark gull. Uh, again, pink feet, but look at that dark beak on it. So if you see a really dark gull flying along with uh, some other ones, you may say, oh, yeah, that's a that's a that's a herring gull. But it's, it's first year. Right. Whereas the ring-billed gulls, again, they tend to have the ring about around the beak, yellow legs and feet. So hopefully they're all standing in a parking lot, not sitting. Um, if, if you have to, you can move up close to them. They will all stand up, maybe not fly away, but then you can say, oh, okay. But you can also see, you can also tell the difference in size too. Because when they're, when they're sitting down on the, on the pavement, just sometimes it's a little hard to tell. Um, our, our route that I usually have, we get them at uh, Walmart, Sam's Club. They're, they're the Walmart and Sam's Club gulls. So pay real close attention to the gulls. If you see a gull that doesn't have any black on the wingtip, get a picture of it. Yeah, uh, Glaucus gulls, Glaucus winged gulls, Iceland gulls. There's a lot of gulls that they're white, have white tips of the wings. Next. All right, here's the turkey vulture, black vulture comparison. Um, yes, we are getting more vultures, especially uh, turkey vultures hanging around in the winter time. Um, but notice how dark brown, that deep brown our turkey vulture is with the red head in flight, the silvery wing feathers, longer tail, but the uh, black vulture, much darker, again, pretty black, and even the head is black. Um, the beak shapes are different. The turkey vulture, you can see, has a, a kind of a thicker horn-colored beak, whereas the black vulture's beak is much, much, much slimmer. In flight, uh, the black vulture is much more butterfly-like. They flap a lot more. And notice where the silvery patch is. It's more towards the, the primaries, those, those long wing feathers that are, uh, that are for flight. Um, but that's the underside. So really do look at them thoroughly, especially if you come across a, a bunch of vultures that are maybe roosting somewhere. Next. Coopers and sharp-shinned hawks, well, Boy, they sure do look alike. Um, sharp shinned hawk, blue jay size, maybe just a scooch larger. Tend to have a squared off tail, but that's hard to tell when they're perched. Um, notice the, the, the sharp shinned hawk here has the dark head and the dark is going all the way to the back of the back. And 
often it has those those white spangles on its back. Now this is this is an adult bird. Whereas the Cooper's hawk, much larger, uh, crow sized. Uh, they're slim hawks. They are the flap flap glide. They're the hawks that tend to come to your bird feeder to eat the the morning doves and starlings and things that come to your feeder. So they are speedy, short winged, long tailed, and they come in and you know grab a bird uh, sometimes that it, that you don't even realize wow what was going on. Uh, but the Cooper's hawk notice that just has the black cap and not the not the spangles on the back. They're a slim, slim hawk. Okay, get a good look at them. So size difference. Again, blue jay, maybe slightly larger. Females can be slightly larger versus crow size. Now, let's take a look at them at another view in flight. And these are immature or juvenile birds. Um, I never really look at this when I'm, and I I rarely see uh, sharpies, but some people sharp shinned. I'm sorry, I'm going into the the bird mode. Um, the sharp shinned hawk. I I don't look at this very often, but the head doesn't protrude very much from the leading edge of the wing. Whereas the Cooper's hawk, man, that head is way sticking out from the leading edge of the wing. Um, and like I say, both of these are, are juvie birds, so they don't have that gray back and the uh, rusty striping. They have all those spots and speckles. And so, uh, again, if you're not sure, just get, do a description, uh, take a photo if you can. In flight, I know it's pretty hard, but I think you can do it. All right, next. All right. Much, much more common hawks, uh, the red-tailed hawk, which are the buteos. They're a bigger, heftier hawk. Same thing with red shoulders, although the red shoulders are much small, are smaller than the red tails. And these are adult birds. So you can see red tails, very easy to ID with the reddish tail. Um, they often have a band of streaking across their belly. Sometimes people say it's a belly band. If you're traveling, you know, you're sitting on a tree uh, by the freeway and you see bright white breast and, and bright white kind of under their uh, belly areas, um, there are lightest colored hawk uh, that you see underneath for their undersides. The red shoulder, you can see, has a lot of that orange streaking on the, the breast, but I always notice this checkerboard wing, wing pattern. And then, of course, the black and white striped tail, All right? So that's something that, oh, and they're noisy. They're noisy, always call, calling a lot, whether they're in flight, sitting, and they are becoming a very, very common hawk um, in some suburban areas. So do watch for those. I tend to see more red tails along freeways, whereas the red shoulders tend to be more in our forested areas. Next. Here are uh, immature or juvie birds. So the red shoulder, oh, by the way, flip back to the uh, adult birds. Notice that both of these birds have dark eyes, all right? Now go back, go to the immature and they have yellow eyes. So you'll say, ooh, that's a young bird. That's what was hatched this year. Um, so let's start with the red tail. It doesn't have the red tail yet. You might see some reddish in the tail and very, very thin bands. Um, it can have a belly band at this, this time as well. And often on its back, you'll see kind of flecking of white, almost like a V pattern on the back. Whereas the red shoulder, smaller, I can I can already see that checkerboard pattern. It's not black and white, it's tan and brown, but it's there. You don't see the striping on the tail. You see teardrop shapes all the way up and down the breast and into the belly. Next. Oh boy, I like it when they when they sit next to each other like this. And we're always going to see them on our Christmas count sitting right next to each other, right? No. All right, so downy, hairy, well, um, you can see clearly that the hairy is considerably bigger than a downy woodpecker. Um, the hairy has a much longer beak compared with the downy. I mean, look at that dinky, 
dinky downy. Look at that dinky beak that that downy has. It is about half the length of the head. Whereas a hairy woodpecker, that beak can be almost the length of the head from the base to the back of the head. So it's quite a bit longer. Um, spotting on the tail, uh, no spots on the hairy. There should be spots on the downy outer tail feathers, but this one is not showing it. So, hmm. so again, keep your eyes open on the downy and hairy woodpeckers. Sure, absolutely. This is a fe this female downy, so you don't see the red there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Next. Okay. Again, it's another little raptor, uh, kestrels, and they. They're a little harder to find, but they're around. Um, so female kestrel, you can see is brown with that nice face pattern. Uh, they'll be out in open field areas, grassy areas, old fields, um, hunting for mice primarily at this time of the year, maybe some small birds. If the weather's warmer and there are some insects, they may be catching insects, you know, never know. The male, much more colorful with the rust and the, the blue-gray wings. Again, the very, very uh, detailed face pattern. And then a merlin, not too much larger than a, a kestrel, um, liking open areas, uh, almost like a, a savanna where you have some trees scattered and open areas, like a, like a, um, a college campus or a golf course. Um, so, uh, so uh, let's see where, oh, I've seen them at the uh, uh, Berea Fairgrounds. Again, open areas, um, but notice it doesn't have that fancy face pattern. This one is uh, has the gray back and different speckling on the breast. This is a male, the females would be brown, much more brown. Okay, just get a good look at them. All right, next. Oh, Wren, so fun. All right, now, again, I've, I've kind of blown these up a little bit. This thing should be about the size of my thumb. <laughs> They're the, the winter Wren, they are like the mouse of the bird world. They like thick, brushy areas. How Gautam got a photograph of a winter Wren sitting up like that good photography, but, um, but they like thick brushy areas and they're a little, there are a little dinky wren, um, little upturned tail, much more speckly brown, and they tend to bob up and down like that. Okay. Whereas the Carolina wren, much larger, about the size, not quite of a house sparrow, but close to it, but you see much more uh, warm brown, the rusts and the rufous, but the white uh, or the light colored eye stripe, or I'm sorry, uh, supercilium or eyebrow. They're around. Next, kinglets, golden crown versus ruby crown. Um, you Supposedly we have more golden crowns in the winter, but we have, reports of ruby crowned kinglets. Again, take a good look at both of these birds, especially their faces. Um, the ruby crowned kinglet, you're not necessarily going to see the little crest of, of red if it's if it's a male, but look at that white around the eye. To me, it's as if they're, they have a surprised look like, oh, you know, their eyes are really big, like, whoa. Um, and they move around a lot, both species. Whereas the, the golden crown, you can see the stripes on the head. You can see the stripe through the eye. It just has a very, very different appearance. And they move around a lot, a lot. Next. Don't forget the starlings. This is what they look like in the winter time. People get confused all the time. Starling, little stars. Look at, isn't that cute? I think they're really pretty in the winter time. Um, and look at look at fruiting trees again, cemeteries, uh, campuses or or parks where there are fruiting trees. They're going to be uh, especially those calorie pears that that have been planted in neighborhoods. 
these guys are going to be eating those mushy, squishy fruits. Uh, they may be mixed in with robins, but this is what they look like in the winter time. And lots of them usually together. Next. Well, winter finches, I don't know. Is it going to be a winter finch year? I don't think it is either. But you know, you just never know when you have a bird feeder out or you're out and you're like, whoa, this is not a goldfinch. These are evening grosbeaks and they are really, really cool looking birds. Um, so very large beak, gross beck, big beak, um, big white patch on the wings. They usually are in flocks and they like sunflower seeds or the seeds of uh, box elder. Next. This is a confusing one, purple versus house finch. And so we have a male and female purple finch on the right-hand side. And it def notice both the male and the female have a kind of a dark mask on the face. Now the male uh, purple finch is to me a much more burgundy red in color. So as if it dip dipped in burgundy wine. Uh, whereas the house finch is much more red, but you don't really see that mask on the on the face of the of the house finch as much. Which is more common? The house finch. I I, I think I have. I don't know. I know you do. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll they'll be at feeders. They'll come to feeders. I mean, purple finch will as well, but but the uh, per, uh, the house finch is the one that we have at feeders. And again, they will also be feeding on seeds of the calorie pear and a few other things too. So you just never know. This is the male. Um, not as red as a cardinal, but definitely much more, uh, I don't know what you can call it, cranberry, no, not even cranberry, Kool-Aid, red cherry Kool-Aid, I don't know. Jello, okay. Next. Uh, female house finch, stripey versus the pine siskin. And there were pine siskins this past fall flying through. Uh, I've had lots of goldfinch at my thistle feeders or my Niger feeders and not a single pine siskin. But please do notice lots of stripes. Both these birds have lots of stripes on them. Um, the siskin tends to have a whitish or to yellowish stripe on the wing, but a super thin beak very, very thin and a small bird, again, about the size of a goldfinch. Whereas a house finch is much more uh, sparrow, like a house sparrow size. Next. And again, if you're lucky, maybe you come across a common red pole. Again, comparison, lots of stripes, a lot of brownish stripes. The red pole, well-named red, a little little cap on, of that on his head. Um, and little black goatee, little black around the eyes, whereas the siskin does not have it. You'll notice it. Again, the red pole about, again, goldfinch size. So look for these kind of birds among goldfinch. Uh, old fields where there's, where there's uh, goldenrod seeds, things like that. They will, they will be feeding in those areas. Next, sparrows. Always fun. Uh, again, a lot of them will be coming to feeders. So you have your song sparrow, lots of streaks on the breast, that dark, I don't know, mustachial type thing coming down from near the near the beak, and then a darker spot in the center of the breast. Whereas the fox sparrow, a much larger sparrow, much more rust in color, but look at the face, much grayer much, much, much grayer. Central spot on the breast. Um, and then the, the, the streaking on the fox sparrow is not like stripes on the, on the, how, uh, on the song sparrow. They look more, more like little arrowheads, all kind of stacked up one on the other. Often these birds will be on the ground, shuffling through the seeds, uh, kicking the seeds around. And um, so when, when you're looking at a bunch of sparrows, house sparrows, there may be something else tossed in there. Look through the birds. Next. 
a swamp sparrow and white-throated sparrow. Sometimes people get a little confused. The swamp sparrow, again, about the size of a song sparrow, rusty wing, may have a rusty cap, kind of a bland face, but it does have a little white on the throat. Notice it doesn't have all the streaking of the of the uh, uh, song sparrow or the um, fox sparrow. So these are kind of clear breasted. You see some streaking, but it's not that heavy streaking. Do they have to be found by swamps? No, uh, they can be in grassy areas. Now the white-throated sparrow, that it, boy, they can they can look quite different. This is a brown or tan uh, striped bird, but look at that yellow spot right in front of the eye, or it's just a little above the eye, and it does have a white throat. They're a bigger they're a bigger sparrow too. Next, uh, American tree sparrows are here, and they will come to feeders. Kind of a rusty uh, above, wing bar, central breast spot, but no other streaking on the breast. Rusty cap versus a chipping sparrow, which really should be out of here, but a few hang around. Um, notice the chipping sparrows, when, when they're in your yard in the spring, summer, they have a nice rusty cap. But in the winter, nope. But the black line through the eye, that's a real distinctive thing. So do take a look. Oh, American tree sparrow, two colors of the beak. The upper mandible is a blackish or dark, dark gray, whereas the lower mandible is more yellow. Good. Next. And here's a nice white-throated sparrow. Remember I showed you the tan striped form. Here's one nice black and white stripes, nice white throat. Um, again, you don't see the streaking on it, but the white crown sparrow oh no where's the white crown well they can have they can have black and white uh stripes on their head but look at the beak it's pink 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 they got a little more pointy head uh real distinctive that is a immature or a first year bird um so that was a bird that maybe hatched this year and is visiting your feeder and then another pink beaked bird is the field sparrow but look at that eye ring and they're little they're tiny so watch beaks watch stripes watch how they act watch the size you got it down pat good all right next red wing blackbirds um it's amazing how many times oh look at this gigantic sparrow not okay uh, female red wing blackbirds and more and more and more blackbirds are beginning to hang around in our area. I think if we looked back at, at the data uh, of just our circle, we'd find that the first few years, first lots of years, no red wing blackbirds, but they are becoming a bit more common. Um, so female red wing blackbird can look quite different from the male. Males at this time may have a lot more brown striping on their on their feathers. Don't worry about the red and yellow on that epaulet, on that sh uh, shoulder. Um, you may not see that. And then a, a bird that's overlooked all the time, and these can be around as well, rusty blackbirds. If you have wetlands where birds will come in and roost in the evening, uh, Lake Abrams, the Fowles Marsh behind Southwest Hospital are two great places to be there in the evening uh, or in the early morning as the birds are taking off. They are, they are great roosting places for uh, red winged blackbirds. Some rusty blackbirds may be tossed in. And yes, they are rusty at this time. But look at that eye. It's a yellow eye, okay? So pay close attention. And they sound like a, a rusty gate. Squeaking, squeaking. All right, next. Oh, here's another something with a yellow eye, but, but look how different that looks. That's a, a nice uh, iridescent purplish blue head, long tail, the common grackle, and then the brown headed cowbird. And often these blackbirds will hang out together. Rusty's not as much, but again, if you have some blackbirds coming to your feeder, look through them. 
sort out the rusties from the grackles, from the cowbirds, from the red wings. They all add up. Next. One of our few warblers that hangs around here in the wintertime is the yellow rumped warbler, very aptly named because of the yellow rump, but it also has a little yellow patch often on the side, may even have a little patch of yellow on the top of the head, but certainly not the vibrant color that you see in the spring uh, on migration. Um, look for places where there's poison ivy. Poison ivy fruits, this is what they eat. So pay real close attention to, I mean, January, you will have, have yellow rumped warblers. Christmas bird counts, we can get a yellow rumped warbler too. So just keep your eyes open, they're here. Is that it? I think that's just about it. And we wanna thank all the folks that did provide the, the photographs. Next. And thank you. And please consider becoming a member and joining us. So I think that's it for the, for the evening, at least my part. So all right, I have a sign up sheet. I don't know if we can pull up. We do here. have a question on oh, the chat oh, if okay. you want to take that now I, I or can't wait. Sure. Okay. So um Doug Wetzel wants to know can you use the Merlin sound app to ID birds? You can with caution. Um Merlin sometimes picks up things that aren't there. Um, so if you if it if 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 it picks up a rusty blackbird, see if you can find the bird. Uh, if it picks up a bob white, better double check that one. <laughs> yeah. But um, if it picks up somebody sneezing in the neighborhood, uh, <laughs> give them a tissue. Uh, anyhow, so really, um, do do be do be cautious. I know some people like Merlin, 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 and and you know they'll write down everything that Merlin hears. Uh, but please do search it out. It's it's really uh, worth it. Or if you could get a, a recording, that would be awesome too. Thanks. Any questions here in our studio audience? <laughs> yes. Oh, not online, right here, right now. Yep. As a matter of fact, I'm sending around a sheet to sign in. If you think you know where you would like to help, if you don't know, I generally put people might, who might be newer birders in areas where, where we have seasoned birders like Bill and Al and uh, myself and the Romitos. And so I try to put folks and Michelle, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, but I try to put people together so that you, you can learn from each other and have fun. That's what it's all about having fun as well too. And Nancy, the folks on Zoom, how would you like them to sign up? Give me a give me a call, email, whatever. Again, Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. You could put that in the chat for them. Yeah, I will do that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any further questions? No. Okay. Again, you can come up and take a look at at our our map here. Uh, again, please do check out the information at the back table so that uh, you can pick some things up. We have our latest newsletter and we have, this was a, a, a mistake by the printer. Um, these are just checklists that you can take home. These are not to be used for the Christmas bird count, but these are just for fun. But there's a whole bunch of these that they misprinted for us. They put it on too lightweight a paper. So take these home, use it at your feeder, use them at, uh, you know, when you're out. eBird is good too, so, but this is fun. Yes. Can you bring a family member who's not here? Oh, absolutely, yes. We highly encourage family members, friends, little kids, big kids, old people, young people, absolutely. Yes, yes, we want everybody involved. And that's why I, I always uh, encourage people, mm, I don't really wanna go to, to the park. Walk your neighborhood. You know where the birds are. Watch your feeder. What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh my, 
yeah, not a good idea. Please do not bring pets. It doesn't, uh, birds don't re realize that dogs are our companions. Birds think dogs are a potential predator. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you, thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming this evening. I can't wait to have everybody here involved and I will be in touch with, with folks, folks on Zoom. Again, please let me know and we'll pair you up with somebody, put you in a group um, and, or if you wanna do your own feeder watch, that's cool too. Thank you and have a good evening, everyone.